Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the, uh, uh, what's a fairly new, what, well, it's actually an old argument that goes back to the late 1800s, around, right, right around the time of Darwin, about the 1870s, and it's the argument that, uh, that Jesus is just a legend or a myth, okay, and, uh, and that's making a comeback now, not in scholarly circles. I mean, Robert Price of the Jesus Seminar is probably the only uh, guy that you're going to hear, scholar that you're going to hear doing, uh, bringing this out. Um, but it's a, a real popular type of argument. Now, Robert Price does not believe Jesus ever existed. Okay? Um, so that's one version of the uh, Jesus is a legend uh, view. Uh, the legendary hypothesis is that Jesus never even existed as a human being. His whole life is legendary. Um, others, m most who hold this view, though, would say, no, Jesus probably existed, and he probably was even crucified and died, but certain elements of his life were never meant to be taken literally, and so uh, the early church borrowed um, from ancient pagan legends and myths and, um, and taught these things about uh, Jesus. Now, according to Dr. Craig Evans of Acadia Divinity School, um, Dr. Robert Price is promoting the discredited Christ myth theory of the uh, 19th century. So, so Robert Price wants us to ignore 150 and 50 years of progress in critical studies. It's really, this is reluctant progress. If, uh, unless you're an evangelical Christian already, which very few of these guys are, if you become a New Testament critical scholar, you're joining a profession that purposely, the main goal of that profession is to discredit the New Testament. And so they come up with all these biased principles against the reliability of the New Testament, yet, um, even using their biased principles, they're finding more and more of the New Testament to be historically reliable and harder and harder to uh, discredit it. So it's come a long way. Well, Robert Price wants us to ignore that and go way back to like the 1870s with F.C. Bauer and, uh, and some of the lame views there. So... Um, uh, but we're going to try to comment not just on Robert Price's view that Jesus is a legend, he never existed, but also the other view as well. Well, Jesus was existed, but he was a regular guy, and then all these other legendary things came about. Now, let me say what I'm not going to talk about today, but would be a very fruitful way to approach this, in fact, I think, in a sense, kind of like a one-two punch. You cannot, I, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do the, kind of like the left hook, I'm going to do, take the approach uh, that we're going to refute the idea that Jesus is a legend. But you can also come at it from the other perspective and show the New Testament is historically reliable. And so that's where you go, the number of copies of the New Testament, how early they are, how close they are to when the originals were written, the agreement among the, the manuscripts, how the New Testament is by far the most accurate of all, the most reliable of all ancient writings, um, how you can reproduce in the first 600 years or so of church history, you can reproduce all but 11 verses of the New Testament just in quotations from the church fathers. So we, we have over 25,000 copies, uh, ancient copies and fragments of the New Testament. If we didn't have any of them, we could still reproduce the entire New Testament except for 11 verses, just from the quotes in the uh, early church fathers. So um, you can go to the pupils of the apostles, the apostolic fathers, and um, see... Um, uh, their, their teachings, how they teach what the apostles taught them, and it's the same miraculous teachings that we find in the New Testament. So, um, we've done that a number of times, um, arguing for the reliability of the New Testament, um, arguing for Jesus' bodily resurrection as a historical fact. So that's the, that's the left hook. We're going to do the right cross tonight, where we're just going to deal with the... Uh, 
um, you know, refuting the legends without providing a whole lot of evidence for the New Testament, because that's what we've done uh, on numerous occasions uh, already. And, and by the way, you can do that. You can go to my website and just look up, you know, evidence for the historical Jesus. In fact, the last sermon I gave on the historical Jesus, I really only used evidence that could be traced back to the, to the 30s A.D. I showed that Paul quotes an ancient creed from the early 30s A.D., but then says, this is the gospel that we always preach, what me and the other apostles. And then went to the ancient creeds and the, and the um, ancient sermons of Acts 1 through 12. Uh, so you can get, uh, get these, these sermons that would deal with that. So we want to attack this. Uh, by the way, the, probably most of the information that I'm getting here, you know, I mean, there's some of it you can get from C.S. Lewis or some you can get from Ronald Nash. In fact, I, I should recommend that book too. Yeah, Ronald Nash, The Gospel and the Greeks, an outstanding book that deals with this. Um, showing that uh, the early church did not borrow from Greek mythology uh, to invent Jesus. Um, and then also uh, the Jesus legend by Paul Eddy and Gregory Boyd. Okay, an outstanding uh, book there, and that's a really current up-to-date book. And, uh, and Gregory Boyd has debated Robert Price on numerous occasions. It's really weird, though, with Robert Price. Um, he's real famous on the internet, um, on the internet among mm -hmm. atheists, but he's kind of an amusement. Even to Jesus Seminar, is the other scholars of the Jesus Seminar, as far left as they are, they think he's a radical, and he is. And um, so, at this point, probably most of his, well, I, mean, I can't say, I can't speak for him, but it looks like most of his best friends are Christians, like Harry Habermas and, mm -hmm. and Gregory Boyd and people like that, because um, um, we're debating him, but even his, even his, his uh, buddies on a Jesus seminar thinks he's, a, you know, thinks he's way out there. Now, but having said that, on the popular level, this is gaining, and, you know, um, we could reach a point, you know, if this, if this became real, real popular, I don't think it's going to get to that, but if this became real, real popular, we could reach a point where, you know, 70% of Americans say, yeah, Jesus is just a myth or a legend. Now, the scholars that don't like Jesus would say, uh, well, that's not true, but if that's what the public thinks, that's okay with me, you know? So, uh, so it's important for us to uh, refute this. I don't think that's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is we're going to get 70, 80, 90 percent of the American public are going to believe in Jesus as one of the greatest religious leaders of all time, but as somewhat of a New Age guru. I think that's the direction that we're heading. Um, but uh, Eddie and Boyd in their work, the Jesus legend, um, they... Uh, they list eight assumptions of the legendary uh, Jesus theorists. And the, the first one right at the top is naturalism, that miracles are impossible. In other words, because they believe miracles are impossible, they cannot accept uh, a miracle-working Jesus, a Jesus who rose from the dead. So they got to look elsewhere for where this information came from. They don't want to call the apostles liars, so they say, well, this is ancient religious genre is you just take these um, uh, legendary mythical stories and you give it to your religious leader. But, uh, but they assume naturalism, that miracles are impossible. Um, the second assumption is that first century Jews, especially Galilean Jews, and remember Jesus was from Galilee and many of his apostles were from Galilee, that they were more Hellenistic than Jewish. In other words, they were more Greek than Jewish. Uh, and possibly they were even pagans. Um, so, um, so that's an assumption that they thought more like the Greek pagans. Okay, and we're going to see this is so far from the truth. The Jews were about as exclusive as you could get. You know, just, uh, I mean, even two thousand years later. Um, you can look at the Jews today. If Orthodox Jews move into your neighborhood, 
are they going to start, you know, hanging out with the Muslims and worshiping like the, the Muslims worship? Um, or uh, going to Christian churches? No, the Orthodox Jews are, you know, they'll be very courteous to people of other faiths, but they are serious and they are not going to blend their religion with others and they're going to be very upset if their Orthodox Jewish daughter marries a non-Orthodox Jew or a non-Jew for that matter. So, so first, miracles are impossible. Second, that uh, first century Jews were more pagan or Greek. Um, number three, they assume legendary parallels to the Jesus story. Uh, we're going to see that this is really overblown. Um, what you do, you'll have stories about a God somehow coming back to life, and they'll say, wow, that's, that sounds just like the resurrection. But when the guys report this, they take Christian terms and stack the deck so it sounds like we're talking about the same thing, but when you read these writings, they don't use those Christian terms, and you find that uh, the return to life is more of a zombification, or um, like Osiris, where he comes back to life in the netherworld, or, um, or just a resuscitation, where they return to this life, not a full-blown resurrection to an immortal body. Um, so they claim there's legendary parallels to the Jesus story. Um, uh, they appeal to the silence about Jesus in ancient non-Christian writings. Uh, there really isn't a silence about Jesus. If you take, I mean, if you count the separate, the 27 separate New Testament books as separate books like you would do for anybody else, and then you take like Josephus, the Jewish historian who talked about Jesus, he died in 97 A.D., and Thallus, who uh, wrote in 52 A.D. about Jesus, and Tacitus about 110, 115 A.D., and Pliny the Younger, and Emperor Hadrian, Emperor Trajan. I mean, you start adding these up in Lucian, uh, you actually have way more accounts uh, of Jesus within 150 years of his life than you have for any of the Roman emperors. Now, if you take out, if you just, because you're biased, you take out the 27 New Testament books, Jesus still has more written about him than most of the Roman emperors. So, I mean, it's like, look, you got a carpenter from Nazareth who became a rabbi and chose not to travel, not to go on world tour and train his disciples. You've got to explain why there's so much mention of him. I mean, you get biographical information about Jesus uh, during the lifetime, you know, the Gospels during the lifetime of his contemporaries. Jesus died in 30 A.D., but he was still a relatively young man. And by 80, 90 A.D., you've got the, the Gospel accounts, even if you take some of the later dates. Uh, you want a, your first biography of what, Alexander the Great? You've got to wait like 400 years after the guy is dead. Yet nobody questions it. Yeah. So, um, so whatever the case, um, it's simply not the, it's simply not true that there's a silence about Jesus in ancient non-Christian writings. Um, and they talk about the silence about Jesus' life in Paul's writings. Hey, let me tell you, that can cut both ways. Jesus didn't tell us about details. In one sense, Jesus didn't tell us about details. Of, uh, Paul didn't tell us about details. Of Jesus' life. Well, that's because he assumed his his readers that he's writing letters to already know the details of his life, and that's for one of two reasons. Either number one, Paul told them when he planted the churches, so they got the information already, or number two, uh, he may have brought them a gospel. What if he commissioned Luke to write his gospel in the 40s A.D.? I don't see any any, any evidence where that that could be totally ruled out. I mean, the reason why everybody dates Luke about 75, 80 A.D. is because the anti-Christian New Testament scholars, that's when they date it. And, uh, but it's possible that Luke could have been written in the 40s A.D. I mean, Paul in 1 Timothy 5 in the 60s A.D., early 60s A.D., um, he's already quoting from Luke as Scripture. So, um, so whatever the case, um, um, now, having said that, 
this statement, the silence about Jesus, uh, 